We're now going to discuss more specifically or in parallel security challenges within the region. And uh, for that, Dimo is going to give us a broad introduction. And then we're going to go in the order of the program where uh, Milos, Addis, Karen, and Marlena will speak about their national case study, but hopefully also linking it to, um, to the broader regional security challenges. So without further ado, um, let me turn to you. Thank you so much, Kudipsula. Let me say it from the outset, how much yeah. special this occasion feels to me, having been here at the very start. Indeed, actually, I was one of the people who was carrying all those books about Brazil and other <laughs> places. So, uh, yeah. The office committee is all to uh, invade or, or take over a uh, special operation. Uh, we had a Portuguese fellow moving out after he went to the operation. And I was obviously here on the 10th occasion in 2012. And we were already discussing some of the issues and concerns that the press that were uh, going to move out. So my brief today from uh, Jonathan, who gets all the credits for, for putting this exciting forum together is to discuss a little bit the uh, great, great talk politics uh, in the region. And as you know, it doesn't get more topical than that because we have a war uh, on our threshold. In fact, I'm just back from Sofia yesterday and you can, you can feel the war. Uh, I was uh, just sitting with a friend of mine who uh, is hosting eight uh, Ukrainians, three, three different families. He drove all the way to Chernobyl a few times to connect Ukrainians. He was on national TV uh, discussing how difficult it is to register their kids at, uh, at schools because of all the kind of uh, problems. <laughs> so the war feels real. Uh, in, in many of those places, even if the Western Balkans uh, is, is further apart. But uh, Kerem was mentioning how he's in, in, in Istanbul and bother to make sure it's now Russophone for intense all purposes. And so it, it's not a faraway place. Uh, you could argue Odessa uh, is uh, a legitimate part of what you could call uh, widest of Europe. I mean, the first country in Southeast Europe to emerge from uh, the Ottoman Empire was Greece. And the whole story started in Odessa uh, to, to be there. But why do we discuss great politics? Why are we obsessed uh, as analysts, academics, and policymakers about great politics? It, obviously, there is a big there, there, there is a narrative shift uh, in Europe <coughs> in general, but also in particular. In the region, the sense that Western hegemony uh, is, is waning and giving way to a more textbook competition. And I can give you a couple of examples from the Balkans how this conversation is trickling down. Um, obviously, uh, the response to the war in Ukraine, where you have uh, Serbia as well as uh, Turkey catching their bets. And on the one hand, supporting the Western effort, especially in the case of Turkey, but at the same time resisting uh, pressure to join the sanctions in any meaningful way. Uh, for instance, Serbia imposed sanctions on the Yanukovych family. I mean, that's how they want to tick the box. And later on, they impose sanctions on, on Belarus. And even that is, that is partial, just to get all the I'm sure you will know, we'll share greater details. Now, Turkey today, uh, hosted um, Sergei Lavrov, who was uh, prevented from coming to Belgrade the other day because several countries in this part of Europe closed their airspace, but now he was, he was invited to conduct negotiations, ostensibly about access to Odessa. But again, the headline for me is how key players in this southeastern Europe are not taking sides or trying to. Um, has their bad, so get some benefits from, from the situation. Case study number two, COVID-19. We forgot about it, but it's, it's still there. And you saw how uh, China stole the show in the region, even if the European Union paid up the bill and it's this uh, came of the big financial package, which is made visible in the mm -hmm. member states, but also in the Western Balkans arguably. But what got registered in people's mind is how which it welcomed uh, the Chinese uh, shipment of uh, 
personal protective equipment. So PPE all of a sudden is not also degraded, it's to something else. Um, <laughs> Russia tried to do its own PR show, Turkey did its PR show as well. Uh, and the message the global audience has got from the focus is it's a, it's a rut. You have not just the West providing uh, public goods, but you have other centers of power uh, involved in the same thing. Another case study, um, the evolution of Turkish foreign policy, <laughs> a more long term thing. And, and we were here discussing my book, but Karen was yeah. kindly the discussant, and it was named over there. I mean, Turkey evolves from sort of an applicant to join the EU into a bona fide um, sort of regional power, which sees itself stuck in between the East and the West and trying to. Um, so who is weight around around the region, uh, and again this discussion happens in the backdrop of much larger discussion to do global politics, the emergence of China, and when we started CSOX, what is China's uh, share of global GDP uh, <coughs> close to now? Uh, China's uh, exposure to many regions of the world that's not a story that's been developing. And more regionally in Europe, we have a new geopolitical situation where Russia, of course, you could argue Russia is defined by all power metrics, but it has quite a bit of uh, power to play with uh, and is eager or prepared to pull the trigger, as we see in Ukraine. So <coughs> it's only natural that we actually uh, discuss in Southeast Europe, in the Balkans, but also more widely in, in Europe the emergence of this multipolar situation. But here's my message, um, which I try to develop in the book <coughs> on Russia. Sometimes we take a very much bird's eye view of those matters. We assume that people in the region are just on the receiving end of those dynamics. Uh, at, a, at close inspection, what actually we see is the opposite. It's the uh, tail wagging the dog. Um, I mean, to be honest, it's not that the Balkans are the epicenter of global geopolitics. It's not that uh, Mr. Xi or even Mr. Putin are up at night, as, as, as he is um, <laughs> thinking what happens in Bani Luka or, or, or Port Goritz or Tirana. That, that's not the case. But at the same time, regional elites and by elites, also not just politicians, but also business and, and, and civil society, are keen to manipulate uh, this new geopolitical situation to bring external support uh, locally, whether they go always to outmaneuver their local um, opponents in domestic politics, whether to gain advantage against their neighbors, uh, or whether actually it is to scare the West into providing more concessions. Think about a certain middle to in, uh, in Montenegro. That's the same person who used to have business ventures together with uh, the Ambassador of, of, of Moscow. Um, in the good old days, he was a conduit of, of Russian business interests uh, in, in, in the Balkans. And lo and behold, he became <coughs> the principal flag bearer of, of the West fighting the Russian uh, threat. And so it goes both directions. And we have, of course, Vucic, who is the master practitioner of, of this new skill of, of, of playing uh, on, on, on different uh, on, on different sites. Um, even at the height of the European uh, Eurozone crisis, uh, surely some of you remember April 2015 when a certain Alexis Tsipras headed to Moscow to solicit support in Greece as he was trying to bargain with Schreiber and the rest uh, in the in the Eurogroup. Of course he did he came back empty handed. I mean, there were nice words exchanged with, with the Russians. Uh, but uh, it was um, symptomatic of the new mood in the region. And again, uh, local politicians are in the driver's seat, I feel, very often, uh, and to the extent that they're not uh, getting <coughs> a credit. Now, before I bore you to that, um, I mean, this is something I want to work in my next book. Uh, this new geopolitical situation in Europe, the challenges that we face externally, but I want to highlight a lot the, the role of, 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 of locals of small countries on the periphery. And it, this actually connects to our previous panel, uh, my, my final thought, because we discuss um, 
how the European Union failed in those five years to transform uh, the region to um, condition reforms and to build institutions. But what we also saw, uh, overlooked, sorry, um, all those years was how resilient local political structures are, how politicians can actually talk the talk to the Europeans, get the money, and, and run away. Uh, because it's also the, the logic of democracy. They embedded in those political systems. They're skimming the game, if you will. And they know they can be much better than uh, any official from Brussels or any member states. Yeah. And, and they can do enough uh, reform or non-reform to satisfy the, the externals, but at the same time to preserve their power. Uh, does it mean that we're stuck in this sort of negative equilibrium, which all, only gets worse because of the market power situation? I don't know. I mean, there's some focal sites. And I think, and that's my last thought, that the power lies with domestic society at the end of the day. Uh, in the Western Balkans, we've had several episodes of mobilization. And in Serbia, it's an interesting case study with the focus against Vucic. They, don't amount to much in the short term, maybe in the long term, in the political, I know that's the political society, society has ages. They might change uh, or reverse the authoritarian tendency uh, in the region. And, but on this note, uh, as we were discussing today, the ups and downs, I just saw the message that the Bulgarian government is about to collapse. And that was a product of, <laughs> of this sort of pop, people of power moment. So the glass is half empty. Um, so from your geopolitics, let's come back to, to society. And I think that's the right thing. Thank you, Dimo. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's a bird there. So lots of applause will be perfect. And certainly you have not bored us to death at all, taking us from uh, the current geopolitics of war to the long-term China challenge and Russia in the pipeline and all the way from geopolitics to politics, which is exactly what we're talking about in this panel. Um, and so now to comment on more specific national text, I'll first turn to Milos. Um, I'll turn to you. Thank you, Philip. So um, it's kind of amusing to me coming from Belgrade to find that so many people are suffering from insomnia relating to Serbia. <laughs> uh, but it's really worrying so many people given that you know and I, I mean I never thought Serbia would be able to give so many people so many headaches and worries uh these days um I was given the question of is whether Serbia was a Trojan horse uh and I wanted to push back hard against this this idea of Serbia as a Trojan horse um current pro-Russian sentiments in Serbia are probably at a historic high um, I read a lot of the times in the media that this is somehow something to do with some kind of mysterious uh, Slavic brotherhood, orthodox brotherliness, some kind of deep cultural historic ties. Uh, and I'm just struck by my own feeling that this is very often very lazy journalism or very lazy analysis that really is just looking for simple answers and not wanting to paint um, the much more complex picture behind all of this. Um, historically, I think, as with many small Balkan states, including Bulgaria, Montenegro, um, Serbia has had moments when it has been pro-Russian or pro-Western with different amounts, in, um, different balances uh, in that mix. Um, at its core, I think what shaped those pro-Western or pro-Russian sentiments in these countries is much less cultural kinship, um, and much more a sense of which great power was backing um, a particular small Balkan bulk, bulk state and its national interests, um, and a, a put, presenting itself as the protector of that particular country. Um, the pendulum pro-Russian and pro-Western feelings in Serbia, as in much of the rest of the Balkans, has swung uh, in, in one way or another and will continue to swing probably in the future as well. Uh, Russia has at times uh, in history acted as Serbia's backer and protector, this, you know, beyond doubt, the, the First World War being a very clear case in point, I think. Um, but to remember that for most of the 20th century, uh, particularly after the October Revolution, Russia or the Soviet Union were not seen as friendly in Serbia, and Serbia did not have some kind of close, friendly relations with Russia for most of that period. 
Uh, Serbs and Yugoslavs also um, in the 20th century primarily wished to emulate the West. Uh, Serbian elites were often educated at Western universities, uh, much more so than in Moscow. Serbs and Yugoslavs traveled to the West, listened to Western music, uh, migrated to the West. They wanted to drive Western cars and have Western appliances, not, you know, they didn't want to drive ladders. Um, so I'm saying all of this because I would want to debunk this idea that Serbia is somehow inherently pro-Russian. Um, it's not. Um, but at the same time, we need to explain how, um, how, how, why we have these current pro-Russian sentiments in Serbia. Um, and I would say that they're largely a product of the last three decades. Serbia strived to, towards the West, uh, both during communism and after the fall of communism, but was deeply at odds with the West, particularly in the 1990s. Um, there were years of sanctions, what many Serbs see as vilification in the Western media during the wars of the 1990s, and finally the NATO bombing of 99, which left deep scars on Serbia's relations with the West. Um, but I would say it's perhaps testimony to how deeply rooted in the Western rather than the Russian orbit Serbia is that even after the bombing of 99, Serbia, following the overthrow of Milosevic, uh, Serbian public opinion was fundamentally in favor of rapprochement with the West, joining the EU, reintegrating itself with the Western world. Russia was a very, very distant actor in Serbia in the 2000s. It wasn't really, it was barely an actor in Serbia in that period, I would say. But all of this radically changed in 2008 when the US and most EU countries decided to recognize Kosovo's Declaration of Independence, uh, which Serbia and the Serbian public bitterly opposed. Uh, and this essentially blew the door open to Russia's influence in Serbia um, and pushed Serbia into Russia's open, Russia's open arms. Russia came to the rescue, backing Serbia's claim to Kosovo, uh, using its veto in the UN to prevent Kosovo joining the United Nations. Uh, and basically giving cover to Serbia's attempts around the world to block the recognition of Kosovo's independence. Um, again, even at this point, Serbia did not fundamentally turn away from the EU and sort of fully embrace Russia or anything close to that. Uh, indeed, Serbia's political elite at the time tried very, very hard to make clear distinction that the EU accession process was one thing and the relationship with Kosovo and the recognitions of Kosovo were something different. Uh, but at the same time, you know, while trying to stay on a pro-Western trajectory, Serbian elites relied on Russia's tactical support over Kosovo. And even then, it was pretty, pretty clear just how uncomfortable uh, the Serbian political elite at the time felt in that Russian embrace. Um, this is more or less the situation I would say that Serbia finds itself in today as well. The country is economically integrated into the EU. Uh, nominally, it's on an EU accession path, but then when it comes to Serbia's perceived national interests and foreign policy priorities, it's forced to rely on Russia to, um, to defend its claim to Kosovo, whose independence is being pushed by the same group of countries which Serbia is aspiring to join. Uh, and all of this makes it extremely difficult for Serbia to pick a side in this current situation. Um, most people in Serbia, including the Serbian leadership, I think, do not think it's okay to invade a sovereign country, commit an act of aggression, violate international law, or wreak havoc and destruction on Ukraine or any other country. Uh, they didn't think that was okay in 1999, and they don't think it's okay today in 2022. Uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, Serbian President Vucic said something to the effect that Serbia would like to crawl under a stone to sort of be invisible for a while until this whole thing passed. Uh, <laughs> then Serbia has condemned the invasion, but refrained from most of the sanctions. As Dimo mentioned, there was some kind of small token gestures on the sanctions, but basically the Serbian leadership is trying to maintain its balancing act between the West and the East, uh, because I think they perceive the costs of doing anything else as being very high. Um, Belgrade has been sending signals to Washington and EU capitals that it is it will align with sanctions eventually, but this seems to be to me more about buying time uh, than anything else. Um, the bottom line for me is that if pushed to decidedly pick a side, Serbia doesn't really have an option but to uh, side with the West and align on, on Russia's sanctions. Uh, I think that the fact that Serbia has not yet done this suggests one of two things. Either that Vucic has an understanding with Western leaders, at which point Serbia will actually you know, align with sanctions, and this is perhaps something that's going to happen you know, in the next few months, 
or that for one reason or another, Washington, Berlin, and other European capitals are actually content to let Belgrade maintain this kind of neutrality, this balancing act that, it, that it's pursuing at the moment. Um, I just wanted to make a couple more points. I think if, if you really <laughs> want to understand what I think is a very puzzling Serbian position looked in from the outside, uh, particularly why, why the hell is Serbian public opinion um, you know, pro-Russian when Russia is doing what it's doing in Ukraine. Uh, I think it's important to try and sort of see it from inside, you know, the Serbian mind, or if, if there is such a thing, because I think there are many, many different minds in Serbia on this issue. Uh, but I think for many or for most Serbs, this is both a politically and emotionally mind-boggling um, situation. Um, so the, at the beginning of the war, the U.S. Embassy in Belgrade tweeted something like, a call to Serbia to align itself with its Western partners in condemning an act of aggression against the sovereign state and actions which were a clear violation of international law. Uh, I think this enraged most people in Serbia who read it. If it was the Swiss embassy uh, that had tweeted this, it would have probably been okay. Uh, but put yourself in the mindset of a, of a sovereign country which remembers being bombed uh, in 1999, um, what the, this, the, the rhetoric that the Serbian leadership at the time was using to describe the NATO bombing was to describe this as an act of aggression against the territorial integrity of a sovereign uh, country in contravention to international law. Uh, most Serbs, I think, probably legitimately wanted to throw their smartphones at the US Embassy when they read this tweet. Uh, but this is also the fundamental mental predicament that the Serbian public finds itself in. How to side with countries which bomb Serbia and organize the severance of part, of part of its territory, which Serbs think was wrong, in their effort with these Western countries to sanction Russia, which is committing an act uh, of aggression against Ukraine in an effort to sever part of Ukraine's territory, something that I think most Serbs would think is wrong. While in full knowledge of the fact that Russia, not the West, is the one backing Serbia's efforts to defend its own sovereignty and territorial integrity when it comes to Kosovo. Now, clearly, this is a simplified analogy. You know, I don't want to um, say that 99 or 20, 20 were the, you know, the same thing or anything like that. Uh, but there is a core similarity there, which is very visible to most of the Serbian public. And it's also one that has, uh, you know, that Russia has not failed to exploit uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think fundamentally Serbs are pro-European, they want to join the EU, but they are also pro-Russian and they don't want to pick sides. And that is the bottom line in Serbia. Um, I just wanted to make one small point uh, about, yeah, uh, about what we're talking about, two tiers of enlargement or membership in the EU. Uh, very interesting ideas, great for discussion. As someone who lives in Belgrade, uh, who wants to see Serbia part of the EU and wants to see Serbia as a well-governed country, I see a real danger in giving uh, the regional political elites the opportunity to have some kind of second tier membership, where they're kind of halfway inside the EU, but basically continue to be able to do what they do very successfully right now, which is pillage their own countries and you know engage in scandalous amounts of corruption. And I fear that two-tier membership is a path to letting them have their cake and eating it. Thank you. Thank you, And indeed, the tension you highlight in your talk is really fascinating because on one hand, you strongly tell us that uh, realignment with the West is not a question of whether but when. And at the same time, you seem to also say that there is comfort in being uh, on the fence and from all sides. Um, so we'll we'll come back to that, and I'm sure Dimo and others will will have comments to make. But in the meanwhile, Addis, the floor is yours on Bosnia. Thank you very very much, Calypso. And let me start by saying uh, what a pleasure it is to be here today and to celebrate 20 years of CSOCs, this wonderful institution that has shown not only to the academic community, but um, if I dare say it in a Johnsonian hyperbole, to the world that what it means to conduct first-class research and thereby lay the grounds for informed policy decisions, what you were alluding to with the advocacy aspect of CSOC's work, Calypso, earlier. In the Western Balkans, CSOC has had a significant impact 
in particular in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I shall return to this point at the end. The question I was tasked with is, um, with Serbia and Russia seemingly seeming to undermine the dates and settlement, what can the EU and the US do to defend and implement a way forward? And uh, in order to understand this question and why it is relevant, uh, we need to see <laughs> what's, what's currently going on in Bosnia. Um, that we have secessionist tendencies in Bosnia, especially in the Republika Srpska entity, is no surprise. We've had them since about 2008. However, recently, in recent months, these tendencies have become more than mere electoral rhetoric, which it was until now. Uh, a few months back, the Republika Srpska National Assem Assembly actually implemented a law to take back certain prerogatives, certain rights, certain privileges that it had ceded to the central state government. In, in other words, the RS Assembly decided to take back control of these institutions. Just two days ago, they were forced to delay this for about six months. Um, <coughs> due to, quote, foreign policy reasons, and I shall return to those in a moment. So these secessionist tendencies have been growing, and what makes them a bit more dangerous this time around is that the Bosnian Serb leadership um, is in coalition at the moment with the Bosnian Croat leadership, which has not happened previously. But since about a um, year, six months to a year, um, Mira Dodik and Dragan Chovic, the main proponents, Mira Dodik of the Bosnian Serb side and Dragan Chovic, the president of the <coughs> HDZ, um, on the Bosnian Croat side, who wants to stall electoral reform until a new electoral law is implemented, that is agreed upon, I should say, that guarantees that only Bosnian Croats choose the Bosnian Croat member of the state presidency, which is a good idea until you think about it, um, because this effectively makes Bosnian ethnocracy, where uh, overarching candidates from different ethnicities will not have a chance legally. And this, if we are going to reform the electoral law to get rid of the discrimination that we have today vis-a-vis -vis the minorities, uh, we should move into a, into a, into a, um, a direction where we get more inclusion rather than less inclusion, I would think. And in this whole saga, the meddling influence of a third player is often neglected, and that's Croatia. Croatia has been firmly on the side of the Bosnian Croats, bringing up the Bosnian electoral issue at any European forum that they can find, which is also a new dimension. And let me give you one quote from the president of Croatia when asked about the NATO membership of Finland and Sweden. He said, the Russians are playing their, their game. They are the aggressor in this war. And we have our own clique working actively against the interests of the Croats in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I took the oath to protect them too, and I will die a political death for them if necessary. So he directly links the outcome of the internal matter of Bosnian electoral reform and the role of Bosnian Croats with vetoing the accession of these two new states into NATO, which is a new quality. I mean, I should say that uh, Plenkovic, the government, is against this. They have ruled this out. But this is a, uh, something that has been going on. <laughs> At the same time, the European Union has beefed up its troops in Bosnia. The O4 um, uh, presence there uh, was increased from 600 soldiers to 1,100 soldiers. This decision came shortly after the war in Ukraine started, but it was not directly linked. The plans had been going on before, which shows you how uh, how this situation was assessed from a security standpoint. Uh, at its height in 2004, the EU4 had 7,000 troops. And now it was, it was reduced in 2017 to 1,600, and then to 600, and now it was beefed up again. So at the same time, we also have uh, sanctions imposed by the United Kingdom and by the US against individuals from Milorad against Milorad Dodik and Jail Katsuyanovic, uh, first of all from, from the Americans um, and then from, from the Brits, and also recently through for, for, for cadres of the HDZ, 
and they said that the ruling coalition in Republika Srpska is moving to establish parallel structures that undermine the authority of state level institutions, while the leaders of the Bosnian Croats are, quote, crippling the country's democratic processes. So, in all of this, this situation, now this war comes in. And I have actually not talked about one actor who has also been acting here. And unlike the discussions we had previously, where Jonathan said um, accession, the accession process is the only thing the EU has to some kind, uh, somehow exert influence here. In Bosnia, we have the Office of the High Representative of the International Community, which is part of the Dayton Peace Agreement, which is basically a viceroy institution that can impose laws and remove from office people if, if in its judgment, they somehow violate the spirit or the letter of the Dayton Agreement. And since a few uh, months, this position is held by the German Christian Schmidt. And um, he actually imposed two bond power decisions, as these decisions are called, which nobody thought possible. The first one was to hold uh, a Republic of Serbska law dealing with uh, state property. And the second one was actually to, to uh, give the funding <laughs> for the October elections to be held, because the locals were actually not going to fund the local elections in October. It's a strategy that they already performed in Mostar, a city which until the last uh, elections did not have elections for more than 10 years due to these compli complications. So this is the situation on the ground. We have, now, we have now the Ukrainian war, and this is some kind of a game changer for all these domestic elites. And I talked about the decision to halt the transfer of powers from the central state back to, to Republika Srpska. This is a decision that would not have been possible without the general geopolitical landscape of, of the Ukrainian war, which made certain political aspects impossible to defend, even on the local ground. Um, and we were talking a lot about sleepless nights. And uh, I don't think that the sleepless nights are warranted with respect to, to Serbian grain um, exports. But actually, Bosnia is at the epicenter of this triangle of uncertainty that we have all, often discussed in this room. And if a security situation happens in the Western Balkans, it will start in Bosnia. And this is what keeps me up at night even though I sleep quite well. Um, <laughs> however, this, uh, this Ukrainian moment, could it be something new? I think not, because it is temporary. We will return to business as usual quite soon. A uh, medium term, and why will be that medium term? Because, and I say it with clarity, the, UX, the EU accession process for Bosnia is dead. There is no way forward that Bosnia will ever join the European Union with the current construct of uh, its domestic political elites who don't want to join the European Union because, as Miloš was saying, they pretty much rely on, of this, on this system of uncertainty, the lack of rule of law, uh, the establishment of patronage clientelist networks. Um, they reign supreme in this system of ambivalence between between being like a member state, a candidate country, and, and a, true, uh, true, um, a true member of the European Union. So that's on the one side. And then on the other side, we have the European Union, who is not very keen to admit Bosnia anytime soon, or <laughs> any Western Balkans say for that. But then we have heard about, a lot about that. Interestingly enough, um, the, UP, uh, the United Kingdom is quite an interesting actor in this whole in this whole, um, how should I say, this whole trilemma, or whatever you want to call it, uh, because it, it sorry, insomnia. <laughs> this whole insomnia, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, um, they have imposed sanctions independently of the European Union, and their Bosnia policy was always quite independent, and uh, leading to Miroa Dodin proclaiming that he will never meet the uh, British ambassador Matfield again. I think something that Matfield can live with. Um, and even the foreign secretary was just visited Bosnia a few weeks ago and once again uh, showed the, the, the basic understanding that Bosnia's territorial integrity has to be maintained. So um, Britain's support for Bosnia's integrity may be key to unlocking this situation, 
if it is followed by a larger <laughs> international coalition. And the United States has been quite shifty on this, I have to say. They also recently imposed these sanctions, but previously they were actually involved in the negotiations of the electoral law, and they were ready to accept some kind of a backroom deal that did not expand the franchise as it should, should be expanded there. So if the UK can somehow bring the US on board, uh, we can, we can, we can see a way forward. And I, you may ask me about the domestic elites. The domestic elites, unfortunately, are not interested in changing anything. And those ones that could challenge the current system, that could actually, the young, educated ones, that could rise up, as we've seen it, for example, in Croatia, where this movement has been gaining support, they are leaving the country by the hundreds of thousands. I mean, it takes you six months to get an appointment at the German embassy currently to get a work visa in uh, in, um, in in Sarajevo. So, uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm concluding. Um, so, am I hopeful or not? Um, Calypso once said to me that hope is a negative concept. Uh, she said that if all goes well, you don't need hope. So you are hopeful despite all the things. So in that sense, I'm very hopeful that you will find a solution. <laughs> <laughs>
can call it really the tragedy of Turkey EU relations, which is held uh, captive to a refugee deal, which uh, you know has reduced relations to a completely interactive, uh, um, interactional, um, a transactional uh, level. Uh, there are no uh, values in it, uh, and uh, there are good reasons, obviously, for that. Um, so, but now trying to answer uh, uh, Jonathan's uh, massive question, uh, which, of course, well, I mean, when I <laughs> listening to Adis, I thought, you know, there's some advantages to autocracies because, you know, you don't have to talk about all these names, you just talk about one person. Uh, but <laughs> just to add on. Um, of course, it's a bit, uh, it's much more, uh, much more complex than that. Of course, there's Erdogan, it's completely autocratic now. I mean, Turkey has not only exited from uh, a democracy, it's like really somewhere else. But you have this complete fragmentation, leaks of interest, uh, elite uh, uh, competition. Uh, so domestic politics reigns supreme. And if we want to understand why Turkey uh, um, acts in a certain way uh, on Ukraine, on the European Union, then we have to take this into account. And I basically want to briefly look at four points. Um, uh, four sources or motivations and actors uh, of Turkey's, Turkish foreign policy. Um, um, and obviously the most important is re regime survival. I mean, this is the supreme uh, story at the moment. Um, obviously uh, much, you know, in a personalized system, this is not surprising. But uh, five years ago, it was also almost a one-man system. At the moment, there are no principles. Uh, this is uh, a regime which is co completely driven by the goal of regime survival, and we see that um, um, uh, we see that uh, you know in the openings with Israel and with Greece. Of course, those openings can close again because. Uh, of course, for economic reasons, Turkey needs to be in good relations with all these countries. But if uh, local if elections are coming and you need to mobilize the nationalist opinion, then a small kind of uh, a conflict with Greece and with Israel and with the European Union will always be coming very handy, which explains this complete erratic uh, course of policies. You know, you have opening with Israel and closes. It looked quite well with Greece, and now you know it, 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 it's again uh, a growing uh, conflict situation. But there's also uh, ideology. Uh, there are Islamist ideologists, uh, ideo ideologues. Uh, uh, there's the party, um, which also is pushing uh, for a certain type of policy, for a suspicion or hatred of the West, for a Eurasianist reading, very much in line, of course, with uh, with Russia. Even though Russian Eurasianism is, doesn't look very positively on on Muslims, but. Um, and there is also a global Islamism, which uh, which uh, some actors within the AKP still push for it. So you see aspects of this in uh, Turkish foreign policy. And then you also have a residue of, let's say, same politics. I mean, there is still the Turkish trading state. There are the business elites which want to do business and which want to, which try to moderate. There are um, actors within the foreign policy uh, establishment which try to clean up uh, after Erdogan, you know, when he makes his kind of big talks. But um, all of this, so, so you have all these different uh, um, uh, uh, factors working together. You, of course, have this uh, toxic authoritarian male bonding between uh, Putin and Erdogan, which is very important. I mean, once you talk about personalized politics, uh, what these two persons do with each other is important. And it's this, you know, hate of women, of LGBT, restorative, the sense of a restorative nostalgia, which they need, patriarchy, you know, all this is now uh, playing into this. So basically, of course, Turkey is now in, un completely unpredictable, but it is predictable in its unpredictability uh, for the region. Um, it will create conflicts uh, wherever it can if, uh, uh, if, this, if the, the goal of regime survival thus requires. So what I think is important to watch out is when the next election will come, and uh, uh, we can be sure that certain um, uh, certain conflicts will flow from that. Um, which I don't know how many time wise. I have another couple of minutes. Couple of minutes, great. Which brings me to the question of Turkey and the European Union. Um, uh, and um, well, I mean, what shall I say there? Uh, what I find interesting is that. Uh, in a way, Erdogan brings out the worst in everybody, but he's been really able to bring out the worst also of a number of uh, European leaders, Macron, Kurz, uh, you know, who really managed to 
uh, you know, to show how how there is still a very deep Euro fundamentalist position, which is completely anti-Muslim, anti-Turkish, um, and uh, which can be easily mobilized. I mean, living in Austria, I uh, had the uh, the, uh, the great opportunity to experience how deep seated these, um, uh, you know, all these um, ressentiments are, which the European pro project should have been against, directed against in many ways. But I think in many ways, also because you mentioned uh, so the perspective on, on Europe uh, in the global south, um, I think the, the from a Turkish perspective, at least the European project looks much less appealing because it looks a, a bit like in Serbia, uh, uh, it looks much less convincing. You know, too many uh, promises have been made, too many promises have been broken. Um, and uh, we shall see um, what kind of new forms of uh, relationship can emerge. I mean, waiting rooms are not great places to be, but uh, I mean, as in the case of Bosnia, it's clear that Turkey will never become the, the, a member of the kind of European Union we have now. But at the same time, like Serbia, Serbia maybe has better chances, but I mean, Turkey is not going to go away from the map and from, from its geography, it's still part of Europe. So uh, we have to think about how, um, you know, Europe can change so that Turkey can become a meaningful uh, uh, part of it. But at the moment, I mean, what is interesting is that despite this uh, uh, you know, Islamist politics, despite um, uh, the de-democratization, despite the autocratization in the Turkish context, the majority of people still believe that Turkey should be uh, a member of the European Union. The majority of people in Turkey also believe that if Turkey becomes a, a member of the European Union, it will destroy the country. And the majority of people in Turkey also believe that Turkey will never become a member of the European Union. So, <laughs> and, um, you know, if I can end on a hopeful matter uh, uh, on this, I don't know whether I can, but um, I mean, what maybe on a more personal note, what I see um, at the moment in Istanbul, where I'm commuting a lot to Kadika. I'm actually quite amazed. You had this massive uh, uh, wave of migration from Syria, obviously. Um, now we have this massive wave of migration from Ukraine and from Russia. And in Moda, you know, where I live, you hear now on the street, uh, Russia, Russian and Ukrainian and Arabic and, and Turkish still, <laughs> and Turkish. Um, and um, so what's happening there on the ground, I think is really very important for, uh, for the future of the entire region. I think everything is being uh, reshaped, uh, reassembled uh, with these streams of people. And um, you know, Europe has been able to keep out many Syrians. Um, I don't know whether this will be the case forever, but I think uh, the realities on the ground are changing. It will be exciting to see how people respond to that. Thank you. Well, on this semi-hopeful <laughs> note, Karen, thank you so much. You said public opinion has to be consistent, like <laughs> any of us. Uh, and so now, Marilena, last but not least, the yes. guest case. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate CSOX for its 20th anniversary. I will introduce a societal perspective since I have experienced protests against the war in Ukraine in Greece. So I will speak briefly about how Greeks perceive the war in Ukraine the impact of public attitudes on foreign policy, and the significance of current divisions and cleavages in Greek society in regard to a potential future economic or political crisis. Now, concerning the war in Ukraine, the Greek government has taken a very clear stand. It has condemned Russia's invasion in the Ukraine and has sent military and humanitarian aid to the However, when it comes to public attitudes, things are far more complicated. According to a European poll conducted in 16 countries of the European Union, the vast majority of European citizens attribute responsibility for the situation of the Ukraine to Russia. Exceptions are Bulgaria and Greece, where the majority of citizens believe that NATO, 28%, of both NATO and Russia are equally responsible for the war, 29%. However, 
reports in Greece that have been conducted in Greece have led to different results. According to these polls, the majority of Greeks citizens condemn Russia for invading Ukraine. So I want to underline that again, the majority of Greek citizens condemn Russia for invading Ukraine. However, the percentage of citizens who support that both Russia and Russia and NATO are equally responsible for the war is still high. It's over 40%. Research on Greek public opinion in general has verified the presence of pro-Russian, it's a minority, but these views do exist, anti-American and anti-Western attitudes in Greek society. The war in Ukraine has brought to the foreground this attitude, leading to strong divisions and polarization in Greek society. So it is revealing that Greek citizens did not unite in one massive demonstration against the war in Ukraine, but on the contrary, numerous protests took place with competing praise. Polarization and mutual accusations and insults became the norm. Now, which factors can let some light on Greek society's reaction to the war in, in Ukraine? There are numerous factors which often cut across the political spectrum. I will mention just a few. First, Greece has had a turbulent political history, and foreign interference has taken place on several occasions. The most recent examples in the 20th century are the Civil War, 1946-49, and the military dictatorship in 1967. According to <laughs> anti-imperialistic discourses, they have a strong appeal to citizens, especially the ones belonging to the left. In regard to the war in Ukraine, some segments of the left read the war as a clash between two imperialistic powers, Russia and the United States, and argued in favor of Greece adopting a neutral stand. Other segments of the left condemned Russia's invasion in Ukraine, but at the same time, underlined NATO's involvement in numerous conflicts in the past. In general, they accused the West of double standards. In regard to conservative political forces, a significant factor is religion. Since a large section of Greek population is religious, orthodoxy plays a significant role in Greek political culture. Thus, many citizens perceive Russia not only as a fellow Christian Orthodox nation that helped the Greek fight of Ottoman rule in 1821, but also as the main protector of Orthodox Christians during the Ottoman Empire. Thus, emotional and religious bonds with Russia are especially strong. It is worth <coughs> noting that in both Greece and Russia, the Orthodox faith remains a major driver of nationalism. Now, concerning national identity, the debate on modern Greek identity, meaning whether Greeks perceive themselves as belonging to the West or the East, has been especially heated in the past. Even though this debate has been settled, there are still niches in Greek society who are critical of Western cultural and political traditions. And finally, in Greek society, the far right has a persistent presence. Greek far-right organizations have developed social ties with their respective organizations in Russia and are strong supporters of Putin. It is surprising that following the Russian invasion in Ukraine uh, and Western sanctions in, uh, on Russia, the percentage of far-right parties has increased in Greece. Now, what is the impact of public opinion on foreign policy? Does public opinion define foreign policy? The answer is no. But on the other hand, a public opinion influences decision making. As clearly the prolonged tensions with Northern Macedonia before the presence agreement clearly demonstrate. Concluding, foreign policy in Greece can be highly contested. A, there are there are significant political events like the war in Ukraine or periods of economic or political instability that bring to the foreground cleavages and divisions in Greek society that are latent, but they do persist over time. Thank you very much. That was a very brief. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and indeed, uh, very well timed because we this gives us uh, half an hour now 
to have a conversation between you and with the room. Um, I, I, I would just simply say at this stage that, you know, before entering this room, we've all heard of the EU's geopolitical awakening, all these grand words out there. And indeed, Demo started us uh, a minute ago on uh, techno, the techno, techno, <laughs> tectonic plate, God, and the, of great power politics in, in, in this region and whether uh, this is the moment, as it were. And Addis uh, uh, just afterwards um, kind of uh, concluded that wh whether this was a Ukrainian moment, no, maybe well, <laughs> the moment rather than the moment. And, and all of you, starting with Milos, seem to kind of underline you know, the, the inertia and the idiosyncrasies of each of these national stages, the, the ways in which um, the same patterns of memory and conflict reasserting it themselves in spite of the earthquake, and yet how at the same time, each of, of these countries are microcosmos for the region, including Turkey. Um, and above all, uh, somehow the, the very distressing fact that is that hope or not, um, that bottom-up democratic forces never managed to, to overturn the, the deeply entrenched interests of elites um, in the region. It's a forever story. And that somehow, Marlena, the membership in the EU or the forever delayed or denied membership don't necessarily, in, uh, uh, membership doesn't actually guarantee convergence. And we see that overall in the polls about Greece these days in Ukraine, which is fascinating. Um, and, and so, and at the same time, on the other side, you know, a, a, an apparently more muscular EU doesn't seem to be more attractive. I don't know what that says about, you know, um, politics in Europe, but, um, and of, of course, one another things I noted is that the U.S. in this story has made its quick appearance with Greece and a bit in the in the story of pressure in Bosnia, but we haven't talked much about the U.S. in this story. So uh, on all of these questions, because if we speak about security in the region, it's still hard not to um, <coughs> talk more about the U.S. So we're left with a lot of question marks about the, this geopolitical moment. I want to give Dimo uh, an opportunity to react to what he's heard, but perhaps um, we might just throw it back to the room and then turn to Dimo on this. Okay, David. So I'll take two or three questions and turn to Dimo and then again to the room. So David, thank you. Could I re-ask a question which was asked at the first panel, um, which is what will the region look like in 20 years time? Um, and I ask it because I'm genuinely interested in the answers you give, and also because it takes us back to what had been the idea of what we would discuss today, what, Europe, what Southeast Europe looks like in 20 years' time, before Putin intervened. Or after, I mean, <laughs> does it change, does the intervention? Well, obviously, the intervention after, the, after the, the invasion, we, we had to frame questions and the theme for today, which had to be in in the in the in the shadow of the invasion of the Ukraine. But I think it's fair, David, if you don't mind, to ask your question: What will the region look like? But would your answer from six months ago to Ukraine, you know, how different is your answer now to this I, question? I'm looking forward to hearing the answers from the panel. <laughs> So this is my reframe question, but before that, let's add something. Um, the more I listen to these, the more I'm convinced that we should stop talking about the Western Balkans. <laughs> um, we should talk about Bosnia, or we should talk about Serbia, or indeed we can talk about Turkey, but you know, the EU has this tendency to talk about the Western Balkans. And I think that is flawed because although as a region it is important, there are so many divergences. And wait, are we not going to end up with a situation where we may have some countries from the region, I won't call them Western Balkans, who may join the EU sooner or later, but others uh, 
who will stay isolated islands, but not prosperous little islands like Switzerland, but possibly poor and rather empty islands surrounded by member states of the EU. Uh, what do we do? Indeed. Tim. Yeah. Um, thank you for a fascinating panel. It reminded me of one of my favorite book titles, which is actually a book about uh, social media. Um, and it is, it's complicated. Um, My question on the David, a more specific version of the same question. It seems to me the common assumption behind most of your remarks was that neither the elite actors in the candidate countries nor the EU is really serious about EU enlargement. Suppose, for the sake of argument, that the impact of the Ukraine crisis is that the EU finally says, well, actually, we can forget about Russia for some time to come. Russia is on its own trajectory. Now is the time for us to get serious again about EU enlargement. And if we're serious about Ukraine, which will be decided in two weeks' time, that you actually have a strategic commitment. Ten to twenty years. I'm not. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it's certainly possible. There's a discussion of it. What does that change in the countries you're looking at? Who are the relevant actors who might seize that opportunity to change the balance within these countries? And it's important to stress your question is not predictive because in the previous panel we 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 were quite. Um, uh, cautious and uh, a bit cynical about the macros of this world and the forces that the pro, I mean, the importance of the anti enlargement forces in the EU to this day. Take the hypothetical. But you, you're giving us a hypothetical, so we'll, we'll run with that. Uh, so we have three questions. I let, Let's take the, this first run and then we'll go to a, a, a new set of questions, uh, including from the from the screen. But um, let's let's have two rounds. Quick answers, and I want to turn to you, Dimo. First of all, perhaps I give a bit more time than to the others, so you can react to some of what you've heard. And <laughs> to be very three, brief. three questions. Yeah. What if you get serious? I think the best case scenario is Montenegro becomes a member. <laughs> uh, that, that's probably, and we're looking at the end of this decade. I think that's the. The best case scenario, and, may, and of course, negotiations with Albania and, and not must take. But I, I don't see them, even under the best of circumstances, moving into the club. Um, and I suspect the changes at the domestic level will, will be cosmetic. But then the narrative will be not even with a small country, the not must learn Albania, digestible, and we do it for geopolitical <coughs> reasons, which was also the case if you go back in time. Romania and Bulgaria starting negotiations in the year 2000, just after Kosovo. But Greece? And, and, and Greece. But I mean, the Romanian Bulgarian case has an interesting twist. So, who was the big advocate at the time? It was somebody called Tony Blair, yeah. you sure, sure remember. Which actually brings me to something that Karen said about Euro fundamentalism not being a, a big problem. I mean, the sad news is that the absence of the UK from, from the EU makes it complicated, both because institutionally the, the, the UK was carrying the, the flag, but also because it epitomized the kind of society which was, I mean, of course, that might be a bit of self-conception, but it was all from diversity and was less bothered about this idea of a, a Christian or Judeo Christian, as you discuss this kind of today, later, reframe it, the essence of, 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 of the so 2016 was transformational, not in the, only in the sense that Turkey kind of signed this deal on, on refugees, which was sort of a capitulation to the transactional logic, but also the Brexit referendum. Uh, if it was now the UK arguing with Macron and, and, and Germany, there'd be a different world. Uh, but sadly, that, that's not the case. Uh, something that Milos and Addis touched upon about, about uh, elites not being interest, interested in, in change. Now, that's absolutely the case, but again, I mean, the status quo being very resilient is a mixed blessing. I mean, if you look at 
that from, say, Switzerland. That's a problem, right? Those countries are not adopting the world law. They're not <coughs> implementing policies that are conducive to growth. They capture this is persistent and so on and so forth. But then again, states for being resilient if you live in Mariupol or Kharkiv. You'd rather buy, you'd rather have this status quo in the Western Balkans than in the post Soviet space where you have actually real wars, right? So I mean, you'd rather be a citizen of Bosnia as this function so as it is, but with a decent geography, access to, to the EU, and relative peace as well. Uh, I think ultimately the regional elites are interested in waging the, the war of narratives not the real war, uh, because the real war is risky, it's unpredictable, <coughs> it might make you worse off. Uh, whereas if you run headlines in certain markets uh, against the perfidious West or the, the wicked neighbors or minorities, first of all, you have a uh, plausible reliability, it's not Vucic who runs those headlines against the US or anybody else, it's the media in Serbia, um, it's, it's the media which is cultivating the Russian sentiments. The government has nothing to do with it. Um, I mean, that's, that's what he will tell uh, all of Schultz when he comes to Congress. Of course, we all know that that's not the case. That's not how our media sector in the region works. But also, it's a low cost strategy to mobilize national sentiments and patriotism and, and wage wars without actually having to pull the trigger and to uh, roll the dice, which might really backfire. So that's, that's how the status quo works. I mean, it's, it's, it's not super, but it depends what your benchmark is. And I think it's only natural for humans to aspire to something higher. So there's no consolation if you live in Berlin to say that you know, somebody in Kharkiv is much worse off. You, you want to be like people there is no, which brings me to the other remark uh, going back to what Ali said about Croatia. The Croatia is a spoiler. Well, the biggest spoiler in the region is a country called Hungary. So that, that's Serbia's main point. I mean, we can go on and on about China, about Russia, but the one model that is actually applicable is what Viktor Orban um, built. It's not Poland, because Poland is far away. Whereas Hungary is right there, it invests every in the region. Orban has everyone on speed dial. Uh, I mean, this whole model of having a cake and eat it, authoritarian government, controlling the media and the economy, but also receiving the big money from Brussels, is what actually elites subscribe to. And I suspect that also societies are not innocent because social conservatism and, and the idea of uh, sovereignty, epitomized by, by Hungary, has certain traction. So that's something to be said about who's thanks for the EU. And EU geopolitics is a bit of a um, sort of uh, contested notion. I mean, geopolitics, not as EU acting as a foreign policy actor, a unified matter, more like an economic space having just poor effects. And then everybody else, uh, uh, Orban being in good case, uh, being able to hijack the agenda. I mean, Orban is the one who protects now uh, Dodik in, in Republic of Strasbourg. The fact that the UK and the US have imposed sanctions, but the EU hasn't. Whereas even if the EU has the firepower, it's down to Hungary. So, yeah, I mean, what happens in 20 years' time? I don't know, but I, I really suspect that we might as well have the same conversation <laughs> with slight variations. Certainly, that will be the case in Bosnia. I mean, if you read anything written about Bosnia around like 2010 ish, book me as well, <clears throat> thereabouts, it might look oddly familiar to you. And that's sort of depressing. Uh, I, we don't really answer the Western world question, but I think that is right all is relative and all is inertia. So yeah. thank you, Dimo, for this uplifting. Except more about who has a touch. <laughs> there we go. That's what's so worrying. Yeah. Um, indeed. Who wants to pick up Addis and then we just okay. Yeah, I'll try to make this brief. Um Karen, you were saying uh, autocracies have an advantage you have to speak about one person, whereas in Bosnia, I have to speak at least about three, uh, maybe even four or five. Uh, but I was thinking about this, of, of this book, The Myth of a Great Leader by Archie mm -hmm. Brown. Mm -hmm. And I think um, 
something similar could be written about the Western Balkans. It, there are about 10 figures in the Western Balkans and then you understand the region as it now stands. Okay. The, that's a, a little aside. Um, Jonathan, yes, Western Balkans is up. Uh, uh, misnomer, it was invented by the European Union to designate this region. It has no, uh, no bearing on the actual political situation. It's, it's just the countries that uh, had not yet joined to move them together. It, it's a purely technocratic term that is questionable from a number of yeah. perspectives. <laughs> from a number of perspectives. Um, of course, there are divergences in it and the implications, I think, of it. Uh, you nail them. I mean, quite easily, they will, these countries will move at different speeds, which will lead to uh, to a situation where, where we have you know, like a leopard skin of, of some countries that are further along, some countries that are moving backwards. But unfortunately, in fact, the region as a whole is moving backwards if you look at all the democracy indicators in the last since 2010 i think uh, they are all, all these different democracy indicators are going backwards and that's really the warning part even though some of them have progressed on the european union accession uh, path so so how is that possible and that's that goes back to my earlier question in the first panel like are there any norms to the european accession process or is it purely a geopolitical and uh, technocratic thing and then uh, to Tim's question, um, of course, the easy answer would be not to accept the, the hypothetical, but I will do that. Let, let's assume that that's all. But then we're still, I mean, first of all, Bosnia and other countries are not as dysfunctional as, as it often appears in these, in these kinds of panels. If you live there, your municipality works, the garbage is collected, you get your passport in time, you can travel. I mean, the country works. It's just the political elites, the political situation that is a bit complicated, <laughs> which has impacts your long-term, long-term perspective. And, and so if if you really had the commitment, they would emerge local leaders. There are parties that are smaller now, but if they see that this is a genuine commitment, they would emerge and maybe they can have an impact. I mean, I wouldn't say they will, but maybe, who knows, they can. However, you are still a prisoner to geography, to demography, and to economy. And just to take the last point, economy. I was sitting in this room when we had the governor of the Central Bank of Albania, who told us, I think it was 2016, he told us if tomorrow Albania introduced all the economic reforms the European Union wants it to introduce and really implemented it tomorrow, it will still take 50 years for the, lev for the economic level of Albania to reach the one of the EU today. And this was in truth. So if you are a young person in this, in this, even with all the commitment you have, it takes 50 years until you leave, you reach a comparable living standard. What are you going to do? So immigration is a rational choice in these circumstances. Although, of course, Poland and other Eastern European countries are the counterexample of that in, in very fast. So <clears throat> let's not be too... <laughs> Doom and doom. But actually, I'm going to take an executive decision and, and thank you, Alice, uh, to take some of the online questions because the clock is ticking and we won't be able to go all around a second time. So I'd like the next three two speakers to perhaps also address questions that might come from the screen. So I know that we have a, a question from, uh, uh, first of all, an anonymous question to you, Alice. I'm going to come stay with you for a second. What more can be done in Bosnia to make it less of an epicenter of uncertainty? And then I want to 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 turn to the screen and then come back to the to the three of you. I can answer this quite briefly. Um, I don't know. You, you said that we will have the same discussions in, in ten years. In twenty fifteen, Jesse, who is unfortunately not here, Jesse Rovnoshova put together an open letter about Bosnia, what needs to be done, and David and others signed it as well here. And I think it contains all the things that need to be done. So just Google okay, so 2015, the letter that we wrote. It's still applicable. I read it yesterday. It's still great. And I think we need to ask uh, CSOX to send a series of links after this meeting so that all of everything that was referenced might, might come to our participants. But now I want to turn, uh, Anne, I know you have a question for us. And uh, if others uh, online do, this is the moment. Uh, Anne. Thank you very much, Calypso. Um, it, the, the audio is not brilliant, so I missed some of the discussion, and my question may have been answered in part, but my question is a simple one. 
the region seems to have got stuck. Can its politics be desecuritized before these national antagonisms and hostilities are muted or even resolved? It seems to me as an outsider that some countries have sort of escaped like Croatia or Slovenia, but within the region, is there an indigenous or even a Greek or Turkish regional leadership who has a broader vision or does this have to come from outside? It seems very dispiriting when we hear about the domestic politics. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you, Anne. And it's back to the big picture question of security yeah. within or security from without and yeah. stability. Um, so maybe Milos, this and other questions you've heard. Yeah, I, I think the region can quite easily be desecuritized if people outside the region stop looking at it from a security point of view. Uh, I think uh, from inside the region, there are relatively few people uh, who actually look at it from a security point of view and it's something that's going to blow up. So I think that one is reasonably simple. Um, time relating to that question, I think Tim's question uh, really, I want to say, excited me because this, uh, unlike Demo, I think um, if the EU really re-engaged with the Western Balkans, with some coordination with the US, you could see real change. If you could bring Serbia inside the EU, it would, I think it would cease to be tenable for Bosnia's politicians, including both and specifically Bosnian Serb politicians, to play the kind of games they're playing now. This would push them into hammering out some kind of deal in Bosnia and perhaps just perhaps, you know, making that country because there's nothing about Bosnia that actually I think is non-functional. The political elites want it to not function. They like the system as it is. You would need some kind of positive catalyst to move this region towards the EU. Uh, if, if someone were to sit down with these regional leaders and say, look, now you need to do the bare minimum in terms of reforms to make these countries a bit better run, a bit better rule of law, a bit less corruption or less visible corruption, and either you do that or we're going to push you aside and find someone else who's going to do it, um, I think you could see real change in the region. And uh, I fear if we don't uh, see something like that, then in 20 years' time, we're going to be having much the same debates, hopefully celebrating 40 years of sea socks. Uh, and we're probably going to be talking about much more about demographic disaster in the region and the collapsing societies which are struggling to pay pensions and struggling to provide health care for their people. Um, so, yeah, I, I think in terms of the concept of the Western Balkans, as uh, much as I hate this foreign imposed concept, uh, I think if it helps the EU focus on, you know, this part of the, this part of this, you know, its backyard, which has not been brought in on board, uh, I think it's, you know, it's fine. Fine. I mean, I, I, although I want to turn in a second to Karen and Marilena, I can't help but turn back to you, Dimo, on Western Balkans. You, you escaped that question, but after all, um, you and I met 20 years ago when you, and you ended up doing a thesis with me on the Western, on the very idea of Southeastern Europe. It wasn't quite called the Western <laughs> Balkans, it was a bit, bit broader than that, but will you not defend this um, idea that there is more to the, the sum of the parts? Is, um, yeah, but I was looking at the, the wider region as well. Sure. Think of all the connections. I, I, don't, I don't think the Western Balkans is such a burden. Because pragmatically, all those countries have all kinds of other connections. Again, Bucic and Orban, just to give it a positive spin, I mean, Hungary and, and Serbia have developed a political and economic relationship. Um, Albania, think of Albanians living in Greece or in Italy. Uh, it's not a class republic concept that boxes, boxes the region, um, with Turkey resting around. Um, I think it's an academic concern. I mean, the real problem is. To the extent that the Western Balkans is, is outside the EU and precludes you from joining countries. I mean, leaders are pretty flexible and they can work with all they have. And now they're trying to uh, put some third necessity into virtue because they have the Open Balkans initiative that they can be cynical about it, but they try to maximize regional connectivities. But I, I, this is the least problem in, in the region. The, the real problem is state culture, demography, the economy, and basically being stuck in, in where they are. And often I want to give you the last word on, and including perhaps on this question, after all, we are CSOPs. So, no, no, I, I 
said, I will give you the last yeah, minute exactly immediately <laughs> because I first of all would like to know if uh, there's anyone online who still uh, has a question and um, still Anne. Okay, and very uh, the five second follow up because we're coming close to the end. And um, and then I'll turn it back to okay, just a, five, just a five second follow up. I mean, if but if Ukraine takes up so much of the EU's attention in the years to come, can it can it walk and chew gum? Can it do the Balkans at the same time? I'm reminded of 1989 when the EC dropped Turkey and turned to Eastern Europe, and and that was a turning point for for Turkey itself. You are right back to 89 to 90. So we're back to my, my, my amendment to David's question. You know, the region in 20 years, but given the caveat of, of the Ukraine moment, as it were, as Addis said. So, Marilena, then there, you have the last bit. Well, I'm political sociologist and I look at political procedures. I do believe to extend uh, it's the notion of path dependency. So I don't think it's going to be a future that is going to be, to, it will be totally different. But on the other hand, you can never foresee what are the developments and what are these catalysts that may lead to different outcomes. So I'm quite skeptical of foreseeing the region in 20 years, making any, uh, any uh, suggestions about what will be the future. Karen, yeah, do you agree? That, that would have been the perfect way to end <laughs> to end the discussion. But I did want to uh, respond to Tim's question, um, uh, the hypothetical question. Even though I would think that even if the European Union was to re-engage seriously with the Western Balkans uh, due to the Ukraine crisis, would probably not seriously re-engage with uh, Turkey. And I think um, if the Ukraine, uh, you know, if a membership negotiation starts with the Ukraine. That will be certainly uh, a, a symbolic uh, a turning point for many in Turkey who still held uh, um, uh, hopes for a European future, because I think it will be the really, the, I mean, there have been already a lot of symbolic turning points, and uh, but that would be the point after which it will be very hard to, uh, I mean, it's already very hard to imagine a, a EU future of Turkey, but it will be clear that, you know, a country which had been, uh, you know, in uh, an association uh, with uh, with European structures since the 1960s, right? Uh, would uh, is is basically um, 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 uh, you know uh, uh, that that the new uh, a complete newcomer in a in, in a war situation is actually uh, getting in front of Turkey. I think that would be a major um, uh, a symbolic rupture. Um, well, maybe it's a necessary rupture. I don't know. Maybe you you can't really get to that. But they they are aiming for Helsinki. It's basically for what Turkey got in ninety nine. So I don't, I don't think anybody in Ukraine expects negotiations. They expect candidates. Yeah, but you know how how the atmosphere uh, within in, in at the moment you have this amazing pro Ukrainian uh, buzz everywhere in Europe, and it seems to be. I mean, it's great because suddenly it has brought uh, purpose and unity to to Europe in many ways. But for Turkey, it's, 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 it, it, it looks quite clear that, you know, because in the discourses, you know, they, they're white, they're blonde, they're, they're Christian, they're real Europeans. <laughs> you know, Turks look at oh, that. Don't you think that Turkey will be more democratic in 20 years? I could cite you now, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, no, yes, and of course, like obviously, with this current Erdogan regime, there is no democratic future. But uh, the future of Turkey is not Erdogan, and a uh, the, any opposition will be more pro-European, and a serious kind of engagement from the EU would make a difference. Um, but I mean, I think also that the Ukraine crisis really has kind of fanned the flames of this uh, Euro nationalism, or whatever we want to call it. But you know, suddenly we all feel European, and we all know what how Europeans look like. You know, which is funny when you're in you know in southern Italy, for instance, because they're not blonde and, and white, <laughs> you know, all Christian. But um, I mean, these questions, unfortunately, even you know, become more postmodern and so on. But the public debates, really, uh, over the Ukraine war, showed us what 
what your Europe and what Europeans are in, in the great public debate, right? Right. And so uh, <laughs> let me just say in closing, uh, and before passing on the floor to Othan to conclude our afternoon and call us to uh, for a collective picture, so nobody nobody leaves before we hear this and end the party. But before that, uh, I'd like to simply conclude by saying a that of course what we know from this story is that well, as usual, there might be the bright side, there might be a waking up so that comes from the most terrible of tragedy, the Ukraine war. But there's always a dark side. And the dark side is that it's not clear that Europe um, is living up to any kind of idea of, of uh, inclusivity and openness and visionary that somehow this moment is called for. But I guess here in this room at the 20th anniversary of CSOCs, we do have more good news, more positive vibes. Uh, to, for one thing, because I think, as you said, well, yeah, I could cite you, Dima. I think this whole table could cite each other without necessarily always agreeing. But because of the camaraderie and the intellectual togetherness that we've had, not just today, but today as a reflection of all these years spent together, either in this room or, or in all sorts of ways, thinking together, uh, and always somehow hoping, hoping against hope that it can only get better. Is that true, Alice? And that, in fact, we always have a job with CSOX because it will never be the end of history and certainly not the end of Balkan history. So, so we're around to stay. And often I think that we can um, hope to celebrate again in 10 years time uh, the relevance of our program and what we've done here together. Uh, and, and I would really like to thank this magnificent panel, Milos, Addis, Marilena, Dimo, Karim. It has been such an honor to be able to share this panel, everybody in the room and online. Uh, please join me to thank this panel for a great time.